Hello everyone, welcome to Qtrick's second annual Zero Emission Bus Technologies Transit and Operations Conference. Before we begin, I'd like to share that we have closed captions available both in English and in French. You can enable this tool directly below the video stream. My name is Grace Riley. I lead government and public relations here at Qtrick, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our fireside chat between President and CEO of Qtrick, Jospa Petronic, and Alberta's Minister of Transportation, Rajan Soni. In my role, I am honoured I get to connect with government officials daily from across the country and across all levels of government. At Qtrick, we believe we have a duty to advocate for change, to advocate for clean public transit. And that's why we believe it's so important for us to host conferences that enable government and industry and um, the ability to listen, learn and collaborate. So with that, over to you, Jospa. Thank you for that introduction, Grace. I'm Josipa Petrinch, President and CEO of the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to engage now in a fireside chat with Alberta's Minister of Transportation. Minister Sonny, it's great to have you back with us here today, and we're going to move right into some of the questions, drawing on the dialogue that you and I had last fall, in part, and also some of the recent developments in the transportation sector in Alberta. Um, I think there's a lot of people on the line here today. We, we definitely got a lot of participants from Alberta who are joining us and from out west and as Minister of Transportation Alberta we know you have a lot of experience to draw on from your previous experiences and like me as we discussed last year you were born and raised in Calgary in the northeast and I know you have this activist background and this engaged community volunteering background for some of the folks on the line who are less familiar with your background you were recognized and given an award for your work with the, uh, by the YMCA as part of the Canada 150 recognitions. And we know that you've been a passionate advocate for your community in past years prior to taking on this leadership role in politics. I also know that you've had a lot of leadership roles in the nonprofit sector. And of course, I'm a firm believer that the nonprofit sector can do a lot of good for public transportation in terms of innovation. So can you walk us through a little bit more of how your experience from the nonprofit sector working in your community having grown up in the Northeast in Calgary, how all of those experiences merge into your role now and your key outcomes in the past couple of years as Minister of Transportation, especially as we're moving towards a zero emissions transit future in Alberta. Well, thank you. Thank you, Yospa, and it's great to see you again. And I'm delighted to be here as well. And I just love the fact that you started off with a question about uh, about my personal background and how that has informed my work in transportation and even in my previous portfolio because I think oftentimes when we have these very technical conversations we don't really delve into well who are you talking to and what's your background and what what experiences do you have that you know you can bring to your job I mean we all bring our personal experiences so when I um, thought about this question I really reflected on it and I just went back to my childhood, my early teens, and quite frankly, public transit was very important to our household. Very, very important. And in, <laughs> in fact, some of my best friends, women who worked with me on my campaign, women and men, I actually met on the bus or through transit or through the school bus. So we didn't have um, a great deal of income in our family, and there was only one family vehicle. So public transit was the way I went to university. We had a circle route. That was very convenient and I remember I had a, a brochure that I kept in my backpack at all times with all of the timings and there was a number that you could call so you know just reflecting on that. Um, it just shed light on how important public transit is for students and for people like my mom who didn't have a license right away and uh, as I was thinking back, I remember the LRT. Um, and we're funding a number of LRT projects right now, but in Calgary, it opened up in 85 and the Northwest line opened up in 87, right in time for the 88 Olympics. So a lot of fantastic memories are really tied to public transit. Now, as time is gone, we are obviously more aware of climate policy initiatives and the impact of GHG emissions on our environment and climate. So naturally there is a movement towards more green initiatives and uh, and I would love to talk more about that. But that's just a brief uh, overview as to how important I think public transit is and actually the decarbonization of public transit. We're not there, we're not where we need to be, but certainly there are a number of policies that we're looking at here in Alberta. 
Uh, Mr. Sonny, it's funny you say that, like the bus was the way you got to school. It's totally the same for myself and my three sisters. Of course, that was the only way to get to school and around town. And I'm pretty sure if you were on a circle route, I bet it was circle route 73, like uh, bus 73 or one of those, because I know bus 73 used to come by us and we called it the round the world bus. It would go around the city to the university, back up to the northeast, northwest and around back down to the south. So I'm pretty sure at some point you and I were probably on the same C train and on the same bus on our way to high school or or, or to university classes. And I couldn't echo more emphatically exactly what you said. It was the mode of transport for our mothers. And the only way that our mothers could get around and get to their jobs and build a life uh, was through public transit. And I hope that we pass that on to the kids in our lives as well. So having said that, it was clearly a way that your family could get to education, get to, get to make a life in terms of economic productivity, and also make sure that your family could live a good quality of life like ours. Having said that, moving into the new generation now, of technology, you know, these technologies can be expensive. So zero emissions transit technologies, as we talk about at this event, very expensive upfront, but the goal is that of course it pays itself off. Now the feds have come to the table with a whole bunch of money, the zero emissions transit fund. Uh, and so money might not be the problem, but maybe there's a strategy gap. And we've often said that once the money problem solved, what's next? So can you walk us through from the Alberta perspective, what the strategy is now for leveraging those federal funds for zero emissions transit and also possibly integrating Alberta provincial investments or strategies to get to zero emissions transit in a way that doesn't cause an increase in the price of transit, which would then, of course, hurt those families and mothers and kids that we grew up with getting to school and getting to work. Sure. So there are a number of strategies that we're employing here in Alberta. And of course, um, you know, uh, the hydrogen economy and the hydrogen strategies are emerging technologies. So there is a great deal of focus on those strategies. But before getting into that, I know that there is a lot of federal funding, and that's very encouraging. And I know that uh, Alberta, the municipalities have received some of this funding. And a lot of this funding is contingent on using the ICIP funding as well, exhausting that pool of funds, but certainly I will be keeping my eye on what is available and uh, Alberta will be putting through some applications to access some of that funding. But as you might know, we have we are investing about $2.8 billion in LRT systems, both in Calgary and Edmonton. So that's number one, you know, um, accessing funds through the, I can't remember what it was called. I think it was called the Green Trip Program to make sure that we can have uh, light rail transit systems operating more effectively in our cities. And in fact, I had a trip on a, a, a trial trip on the Valley Line just last week, and it was fantastic to see how extensive that line is. And it will serve a ridership of over 40,000 people is what I'm hearing. I'm not sure if those are the exact numbers. So um, I think it's very important to point out that, that we are making significant investment in, in LRT projects. Um, in terms of some of the other work that we're doing, there is a, um, a government funded body called Emissions Reductions Alberta, and they are funded by the tier fund through the government, and they are embarking on a number of different initiatives with several organizations. And without getting into too much detail, we um, are also funding organizations that they are partnered up with. For example, we're looking at hydrogen fuel cell powered trucks that there's, um, and it's a big long acronym, it's, it's Aztec, it stands for Alberta Zero Emissions Truck Electrification Collaboration. Essentially, it's a $17.2 million collaboration where we're working with um, Alberta Motor Transport Association to get hydrogen fuel uh, powered trucks on the road. So that's being piloted right now. And hopefully we will have a hydrogen fueling station open um, in the next couple of months as well. So these are projects that are on the go. And I know that um, Emissions Reduction Alberta also funds an, uh, another project. It's called the Alberta Zero Emission Hydrogen Transit or AZET project. And that is going to have two hydrogen fuel cell electric buses that will be used on um, road trials by the city of Edmonton and Strathcona, pardon me, Strathcona County. And this is a $4.6 million project from Emissions Reductions Alberta. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how these are going to come together. Now, I'm, we're more focused on the trucking aspect right now because we've already made this investment in LRT, but certainly as, as the um, hydrogen initiatives 
um, evolve over time, it will really inform where we're going to go. A lot of that is going to depend on private sector investment. It's going to depend on how these emerging technologies uh, materialize, how that demand side of the equation is going to look. We have ample supply, but the demand portion is still in flux. And uh, we don't have regulations yet for hydrogen powered vehicles. So uh, federal and provincially, like we have to wait for those regulatory bodies to come together and, and put a framework in place. So there is a lot going on. Nothing is um, entirely mature because these are emerging technologies and a competitive cost structure is going to be important as we move forward. But these are just a few of many, many projects that we have on the go. Um, Minister, maybe I'm going to go a little bit more into that hydrogen piece because we've got a large portfolio at Qtric of pushing for hydrogen uh, fuel cell bus transit solutions. And part of that's just the laws of physics. You know, when you look at how these buses are deployed across Calgary or Edmonton or even all the way up to Fort McMurray or anywhere across Canada, there's a lot of fleets where the routes are really long, the conditions are rugged, the winter condition and summer extreme temperature differentials pretty hard on the um, HVAC system. And on the vehicle. So it eats up a lot of energy, basically. And when you're looking at battery electrification and hydrogen, battery electrification will do so much with a lot of chargers. And then there's this portion of large fleets that they're just going to need hydrogen, unless we're planning to add more buses and more charging stations and, and more capacity. So hydrogen is really emerging from a laws of physics standpoint as a solution for a very critical core component of the Canadian fleet. And, you know, having grown up in Calgary, and then of course, worked and lived in Edmonton, those winter are nothing to joke about but on top of it the summers are pretty extreme and so the two things combined mean hydrogen is probably going to have a play but we do know for Calgary Transit and Edmonton Transit one of the big challenges they face is a local hydrogen supply chain that's sustainable for them and this was the same issue that BC Whistler faced about 12 years ago on um, the BC Transit Whistler project there wasn't a local supply of hydrogen and ideally green hydrogen you know ideally hydrogen that's not creating emissions and pollution from the Alberta hydrogen standpoint that you referred to, knowing that you're focusing on trucks, are there any plans right now, apart from you know funding ideas, any plans to work with Edmonton and Calgary on first deployments there with hydrogen fueling with the electrical utilities or any other strategic play there for the transit agency specifically so that they have local hydrogen supply chains too? So that, that's a great question. And I mean, obviously we would, we would love to have a very defined strategy, but we just came up with a roadmap that articulates a framework and it's early days. And, and I know that, you know, we talk about green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. Green hydrogen is ideal. It's not uh, entirely economic at this point. It uh, requires, I mean, water and a lot of energy and the, the economics aren't quite there as of yet. And that could change because technology is changing all the time. So blue hydrogen is um, certainly something that is more feasible. And we have a lot of companies who are looking into how to move forward on this and how to monetize it and how to make sure that we are the leading supplier of hydrogen in the nation and perhaps even globally, because we do have ample supply. So there are a number of things that have to happen before we get to that place where we can supply the municipalities with secure supplies. Um, we've got these pilot projects going um, with uh, hydrogen fueled vehicles in, in trucking and in busing the ones that I just mentioned earlier. So that demand component has to be also built. Like what are we expecting to come into the province? We are thinking of hydrogen powered rolling stock as well for some of the high-speed rail projects that we're looking at. And I know Calgary Banff Rail had mentioned hydrogen-powered rolling stock as well. So that piece has to be developed, but in conjunction, exactly what you said, like how do we make sure we have sustainability of supply when we get to that point? Um, it sounds like it's a chicken and the egg thing, but it's not really. Both of these things have to be developed in tandem. So government is doing its part in terms of funding uh, some of these innovative projects and having uh, strategic conversations with the municipalities. This will take a little bit of time and it's really, again, it's going to depend on what the emerging technologies look like. You know, it's really hard to have that crystal ball at ahead of you and to see exactly which direction you're going in. But that's why we have this roadmap 
to at least say that, okay, we have a framework and we know where we need to go. And within that framework, there's a lot of flexibility as to what the regulations will look like and what private sector's role will be in that. You're, I mean, you're quite right. It's very difficult to predict and then to expect government to solve all problems, right? That's just not possible. And I think you're also quite right that the industry does have to step up and take some risk capital in this space. Um, you know, even Ontario, where we're leading this fuel cell bus project with Mississauga, green hydrogen is four times the price of diesel. So there's a cost to going green in the short term. We know there'll be a benefit in the long term, but there's a cost in the short term. And as your point, as you point out, we need the demand and that's rail and truck and bus and coach fleets need to come to the table. Uh, because to be fair to Calgary and Edmonton, you know, out of their buses, it's a couple thousand buses separated by 350 kilometers. That is a very hard market to serve on its own and get price points low. So excited to see what happens in the trucking industry in Alberta, because that is a robust industry and it's going north, south from Edmonton to Fort McMurray regularly. So great opportunities there. Uh, I think next year we're going to circle back, Mr. Sonny, and see what's come of it. Going from then hydrogen over back to the electrification of rail, if I can come back to a point that you raised a little bit earlier, a lot of investment in LRT, and we've got an audience here from across Canada and globally, and a lot of Canadians don't live in a city with LRT, which, you know, we stop to think about it is a funny kind of thing. Uh, and when I grew up in Calgary, moved to Ottawa for university, I remember thinking, what do you mean you don't have an LRT in this city? What kind of backwater is this? And it never dawned on me <laughs> that most Canadian cities did not at that time have LRT, and that's still the case today. But LRT is electrified and it does move a lot of people, but it comes with problems of deployment. You know, these large infrastructure pro uh, challenges of getting the track out the door, getting the rail out the door, building the stations with all of the partners involved. Can you give us a little bit more detail of these LRT efforts going forward? Great to see them moving forward, but there has been a long period of going from initial planning to actual deployment. Can you walk us through what that long period is composed of and why some of those delays occurred and how they're being overcome maybe? Sure. Well, you know, let's talk about the two projects, um, one in one in Calgary and one in Edmonton. So first, starting with the Green Line in Calgary, uh, there is extensive interest around getting this Green Line built, but there have been a diversity of, of opinions on what that ultimate plan should look like. So ultimately, City Council came up with a business plan. And as a major funder of the project, uh, the province did have a say as to what that plan could potentially look like. So there was a bit of a back and forth between the city and the province. And we had a study done on the green line just to assess the business case. And, uh, and now everybody is uh, good to go. We uh, are just waiting for final federal approval from the federal government on this. And, and you know, there's, um, so there's regulatory things that happen. There are interactions with the different government bodies that sometimes can result in, in a delay. But ultimately right now they are good to go and they are going to have to deal with cost escalation, uh, with inflation, with supply chain issues. So that project hasn't started as of yet, um, but significant um, funds have been expended in the planning of that project. And, and keep in mind, each project is different. It has its own unique set of challenges. Now the Valley Line, which I just toured last week um, has been, uh, under work for, for quite some time. And there's always delays again, related to supply chain, related to unexpected developments. Like I know when they were um, building the bridge across the river in, in downtown Edmonton, they, uh, ex they found a big slab of concrete in the river that they had to work around and that delayed the project as well. So sometimes it's uh, project specific unanticipated things that come across that will um, result in, in a different approach being required. So each project is, is very specific, but ultimately with the Edmonton line, despite some of the setbacks that they may have had, it was a beautiful ride and it's gonna be open soon, right? I mean, it's been a little bit painful, but what they have produced in terms of what the rolling stock looks like, in terms of the new bridge that was built, and the different stations that have been built that are absolutely architecturally beautiful. I mean, we are almost there. So at the end of the day, every project that you undertake, whether it's a light rail transit or, or any infrastructure that's built, there will be unanticipated delays that, are, that just have to be built into the system. 
Yeah, I mean, it's quite true that we don't know what's under the ground until you start drilling or in the river in this case. Um, now, I'll never let developers and construction companies off the hook. I think they make a great profit and uh, there's always cost overruns unexpected. But nonetheless, you dig a hole underneath the city of Edmonton or Toronto, you're going to find stuff. Uh, and that stuff's going to be a surprise. So I think the value and virtue here is patience and there's a great system out the door. Also, for those of you on the line who, who've never been to Edmonton, it is one of the most beautiful places to go uh, in the summer in particular to see that river valley. And if you do get on the LRT and you crisscross, you can see a lot of the city. It's an extremely cheap tourist opportunity for people to see one of the biggest and most beautiful uh, green spaces in Canada in an urban environment. So Minister, it's great to hear that progress on the LRT. If I can turn your attention then maybe to outside of LRT and bus, this is something that was a real big issue about two years ago. I wanna come back to it, the coach busing situation in Alberta and out West in general with Greyhound exiting. If I get on a bus from Calgary to Edmonton, there's no rail line right now. I could fly, it's expensive and polluting. I could drive, it's expensive and polluting to have a car and, and so on. So I, I have the Red Arrow. That's an option. That's good. Um, but the Greyhound was half the price of Red Arrow. Red Arrow is a nice ride and there's Wi-Fi and there's cookies and it's great and it's wonderful, but uh, Greyhound was a cheaper option. And, and there were times when I had to take Greyhound too. Um, without Greyhound, there's a whole bunch of communities in Alberta that are just not connected with coach. And it's not only Alberta, you know, Saskatchewan, BC, there's a lot of issues out West with coaching, but do you have any insight for those of us um, on the line today about what the coach bus industry may look like in Alberta and whether it's causing challenges for people to get around since we don't have rail lines crisscrossing the province yet? I'm really glad you asked this question because you're not the only one who has posed this question. And certainly the exit of Greyhound was in some ways tragic because it meant that many people in rural and remote communities all of a sudden had lost a very uh, valuable link to to be able to travel across the province and and yes you mentioned red arrow red arrow is back in business and they've announced recently some additional uh, routes as well there is another company that opened up um, last summer it's called canada bus and they and i was actually there at their grand opening and they are also expanding their routes and are quite affordable. So what I am seeing is more activity from the private sector in terms of trying to fill that gap, trying to fill that demand. Um, there's uh, several other companies within the province that um, also uh, serve rural communities as well. And um, I don't have all of their names off the top of my head, but there was a question posed at one time, should government be helping these, these uh, coach services a bit more with funding to keep them sustainable? And I know that, well, you know that the federal government just announced transit operating funds, and I'm very pleased that Alberta was one of the first to sign on that. So we have an $80 million uh, investment provincially matched with a federal investment of, um, well, 79 million actually. And uh, that's phenomenal for transit operating funds, but it doesn't apply to some of these, these coach uh, routes that you're talking about. So I have written a letter to uh, Minister Algabra and, um, and I think to Minister, uh, pardon me, to Deputy Prime Minister Freeland's office as well, asking if there's any potential for operational funding for these uh, bus services that serve rural communities. So that letter is out there and, and we will see where that takes us because I do believe that if it is a question of operational funding required to have some of these existing operators remain viable, that is something that we have to look at. I haven't heard a whole lot, only from one or two companies who are requesting this funding, but um, that that is one avenue that we're looking at um, if it is required. But I honestly do believe that, because I've seen it with the, with the new bus line that was announced last year, that the private sector is seeing that there's an opportunity here and they will step up to the bat. I do believe that that will happen. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll just keep, keep an eye on the situation and see what it looks like. Well, yeah, I had a conversation with Mr. LeBlanc federally just a while ago at the beginning of this year, and um, he comes from a small, small town right out east, and he comes from a town where there wasn't, there isn't public transit really, and so his thought process is really about what about all these rural communities. Uh, I put a gender lens to it, you know, there's a whole bunch of women trying to get from northern BC to Vancouver, and because there isn't a good, safe, secure coach system, they end up hitchhiking, they end up dead, and they end up dead in a picked-in-pig farm. Like, that's the reality of what happens when 
people don't have safe, secure mobility. Uh, it ends up not just being inconvenient, it can actually destroy lives. Uh, so that's something that I take to heart. And I think federally, we've got a minister who sees the rural communities very critically. And it looks like in Alberta, under your ministerial leadership, Minister Sani, that's been taken very seriously because it's not just a transit issue. It's a quality of life, ability to live issue. Yeah, and I, I'd actually like to comment on that. And I know that in Alberta, I will, as you know, I used to be the Minister of Community and Social Services, and we have extensive uh, family violence prevention programs. So we there are programs in place to ensure that vulnerable women will have access to transit. Like that is, I've always said, transportation is a social determinant of health. And of course, when you have vulnerable populations, whether it's seniors, whether it's um, people from different ethnocultural communities, women fleeing violence or people with disabilities, there are programs in place to ensure that they have access to transportation. So I do want to reiterate that that is not a gap in the system right now. The government is very clear uh, on the fact that we do need to support vulnerable populations and uh, that funding and the programs are there. But in terms of the other aspects of making sure that transportation is available in the rural communities, that the demand also has to be there. Like we can set up all these routes and if the ridership isn't there, then that's problematic as well, right? So we are looking at the ridership and I know that um, with COVID, the ridership numbers have been all over the map. And as soon as things stabilize and normalize, we'll have a better idea. But uh, yes, just like Minister LeBlanc, I'm also committed to ensuring that rural communities have the transportation modes available to them that they need. It's not an easy fix. It's not an easy solution because there is, it's multifaceted and complex, but uh, there are a lot of eyes on that right now in the province. That is great to hear about the social welfare component, making sure that that's front and center in mobility. I, I think we can always do better as Canadians. We can always give more and in terms of creating more options, but you're right also that the, the clientele has to be there. And maybe that's a communications issue across Canada, making sure that people know that busing is an option and it's a legitimate and safe and secure option. So maybe going from that over to the communications and the next step forward, just a concluding question to them, Minister, with the complexity of public transit and transportation that you just highlighted and safe mobility. What are the big challenges ahead, you would say, that still lie in the way of getting to fully zero emissions public transit fleets in Alberta? Uh, well, as I'd mentioned, the adoption of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles will depend on a, on a cost competitive mature hydrogen infrastructure and proven technology. And um, hydrogen vehicles will be in direct competition with electric battery vehicles which already have an established infrastructure, but unproven for heavy duty road vehicles, as well as trains, airplanes, and shipping. I think um, it's going to be the technology, it's going to be the pace at which it's developed. It's going to be uh, the response of the private sector to some of these emerging opportunities. How will they invest? How will they believe in, in our hydrogen story? And it's also going to be, as I mentioned before, it's going to be, you know, the regulatory framework, which has to be responsive to what we're seeing. So uh, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but those really are like the, the key issues that we're going to be grappling with in the future. But, you know, um, I think communications, you had touched on that, is very important. And I'm a huge believer in, in the, the power of hydrogen, literally. I mean, it's, it's a great way to to move forward. It's a great way to talk about Alberta's value proposition in the transportation sector and industrial sector. And the more we talk about it, the more we will, I believe, attract investment because we do have ample supply here. And, uh, and uh, it's all about diversification as well. So communication will be key as to how we move forward. Well, and on that point, Minister, no, no harm in repeating a message, therefore. Good communication is repeating the message. So I want to thank you for not just today, but the hard work you've uh, initiated in your role. And I do think it's quite unique in Canada to have a minister responsible for transportation related infrastructure that comes from a social determinants of health 
background in terms of a previous role like that that is pretty unique that doesn't really exist in in the rest of the country we've had ministers of transportation who come from an environmental perspective and have that social determinant but not necessarily the diversity of interdisciplinary determinants that you're looking at it from so i think in the interest of all albertans and canadians it's really exciting to see what you've been able to do we want to thank you for your time and we're really excited to see the outcome of the hydrogen strategy and in conclusion alberta is an energy superpower and it has all these energy experts so if anybody's going to get it right it's with all those energy brains in the province so we're looking to you for leadership thank you very much minister for your time today and for everything thank you yasba it's a pleasure always a pleasure to be here with you take care